want to talk about is the perseverance of the saints. Are the old language for your Calvinistic doctrine of election, it stood as code for eternal security back in the 1800s. What we're going to focus in on is the evangelist Charles Finney and show how on one side of the coin he preached a, a holiness doctrine that sounded like he was preaching conditional security and meeting the conditions of salvation and repentance and obedience. But on the other side, he preached the perseverance of the saints. And we can prove it here. That's what we're going to do. So we want to point out that the spirit of error, as we've pointed out in many of our videos, has been hard at work for centuries in the in those church, twisting and polluting the word of God in, in the system. So much of this deception then comes through a means that you don't expect through your own pastors and teachers and the theologians, people that expound on the scriptures. They piece together scriptures. You can take this scripture and that scripture and this scripture. That, so like I said before, you can just about prove anything you want in the scriptures. You can prove that the, the sky is green if you, if, if you want to in the scriptures. If you piece together different verses to prove some doctrinal position, that, then it translates into the study materials and the books and the training manuals, and it gets preached in your church as gospel to you. And that's pretty much where the deception lies. So if we investigate, Charles Finney was an 1800 evangelist. He was a revival evangelist that got saved in, uh, I believe, the Presbyterian churches as, as a youth. And then came, came, came across into the Lord, began preaching, preaching the Word of God. He was, uh, his background was in law, so he was college educated at the time. And he had a very sharp and analytical mind. He rejected the doctrine of original sin and preached repentance and obedience to the faith. And he thundered against sin and unrighteousness, which shocked the system of his day. Shocked it to its knees. I mean, it, it, you read accounts of those revivals and many people were, were moved. But we'll give, we'll give some of our reasons why we think those things may have, may have happened and may have occurred. Many today still consider Finney a heretic. If you look him up on the internet, you'll find many people, because he rejected original sin, he was considered, he's still considered a heretic, uh, but other people that despise this cheap and easy gospel that's being preached everywhere, and there's, there seems to be a bunch and a growing number of those people, they hold him in high regard, and they're convinced that he was a holiness preacher, because maybe they've never read his, his, uh, his lectures on perseverance and election. Perhaps they haven't, but uh, they're certainly out there on the, on the websites. So they're convinced that he preached a holiness-based message based on conditional security. But that is not the case with Charles Finney. I don't care what quotes you can send me to show me, well, you're only justified as far as you obey God. I, I know he said those things, but he doesn't mean it in the way you think he means it. Because those that are justified will persevere. Remember, he don't think David lost his salvation. And he thinks Saul was never saved to begin with. So he has to, see, because he makes that statement in his lectures on election, he makes the statement that no saint ever fell into eternal ruin. So therefore, David could not have fallen into eternal into a ruin in that at least in that nine month period where he did not repent before Nathan came to him after the adultery and murder. He didn't forfeit his salvation. Even though what scripture says that one that type of thing won't inherit the kingdom. But nevertheless, that's what he taught. So what he, when he says that you're only justified as far as you obey God, it sounds good. It sounds like he's saying the right thing. But really, he's riding, he's keeping one leg on either side of the fence. As I always show on my board, you know, the, the difference between the Gospels. So he's keeping his leg on both sides. He pleases both sides by that. One side, they know he's preaching election. And so he's not going back on perseverance as the same. They will persevere, see, based on... Based on his passage in John uh, six twenty six, see, based on that passage, they, they'll 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 endure. He says, "For as the Father has uh, given them to me, I says I won't lose I won't lose one or, or six six. Uh, yeah, chapter six. But nevertheless, we'll get to we'll get to those scriptures." 
So anyway, if you examine his, his lectures, you find that he contended for election, predestination, perseverance of the saints. So theologically, Fiddy would be numbered among the Calvinistic doctrines, maybe kind of a, a lukewarm cave in that he, he rejected uh, the original sin, the depravity thing. So he discarded the absolutes and talked about the necessity of obedience and the, the evidence of the faith had to be there and all that kind of thing. And, and like I said, the, the original sin had, was out the window with him, but yet he still held to some of the other tenets. So the great difficulty in exposing Mr. Finney is the perception that people have if, when they listen or they read his sermons. I, I had the same thing before I understood that he, these lectures on election and, and everything else. See, when they, when they published his books in the 1980s, they failed to publish. In fact, I got on my bookshelf over here. I can pull it right off of my bookshelf to my right here. It said to finish systematic theology. They stopped it short of the elections on election and perseverance. Those, lect those lectures were there at Oberlin College, available. They're scanned into the website on Finney, but they're not in that book. So naturally, I, I didn't know nothing about these men at the time. That was over 30 years ago. So I thought that, that, that here's what the guy preached, and it sounded good to me. So I was, see, I fell under the same delusion as many of you were under about Finney. So Finney, he, like I said, he was trained in law. He had a very analytical mind and a very sharp intellect. He was able to confound his opponents with his impressive oratory and his imposing persona. If you've ever seen pictures of him, you see the, the you know, the, the, the eyes, the, the, the stare, you know, the seriousness and somberness of his appearance. See, as a speaker then, he was able to move his audience into fits of deep emotional distress. And he was unparalleled in his time, just like many people can today, that are, that are good at, at speaking. Look at the politicians. They can get people cheering and stomping and screaming for what? For in their line. Everything they say coming out of their mouth is a lie. But the same thing here. He says, you know, given back then now, let's, let's, let's understand this is back in the 1850s. This is a long time ago. Given that the Christian world of that day, the professing Christian world of that day, they feared God. They believed in hell fire. Hell was pretty much preached then. You've, you've heard, you know, the uh, hell fire preaching. And they knew that sinning would send him to hell. So he was pretty much a product of his particular generation rather than an incarnation of John the Baptist coming back and preaching repentance and faith and, and uh, forsake your sins and all those things. In many respects, he was not far off the reservation with the, his modern Calvinistic proponents, as, as will show. Although they would deny any association with him because of his original sin issue, but they would be forced to agree with him on election, predestination, and perseverance. Piper would be forced to agree with this. John MacArthur and uh, Ed Young and all, all these guys that we've shown in our videos would be forced to agree with this. So, his lectures show what perseverance is. Perseverance of the saints. Number one is only the elect will be saved. God has handpicked, chosen, chosen, who's going to be saved. None of those will be lost. In other words, it's eternal security, as we would call today, OSA. Once saved, always saved. This is, that's how, this is, it's mask, perseverance of the saint is just masquerading as once saved, always saved, or eternal security, as people like to call it today. That God only calls the elect with an effectual call of grace. They're called, they're chosen, they're handpicked. It's his choice, not yours. He bends the will of those that are chosen with this effectual call in this divine grace and brings them in. And in Finney's case, well, part of their obedience and their holiness and their perseverance, that's all worked in to their final salvation. That's predetermined. The fact that they're going to obey, it would be obedient, and, and everything it says here in the scriptures is all worked in then to their to their final to their final salvation. It's like you said when John the six thirty nine, he says, uh, "This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all He has given me I shall lose nothing, but should raise them up on the last day." That's the verse he uses in every one of his lectures in John six thirty nine, that all the Father has given me I will lose none. He quotes that in every single lecture he does. 
So, and then man's final des destiny is determined from the foundation of the world. He made the choice for you. He effectually called you. It was all part of the plan. Calvinism, 100%. Exactly, you, you go to Calvin's uh, institutes, it's exactly, like I say, except for the depravity thing. With Finney, there was, there was still free will involved here. I don't know how there could be free will if he'd predetermined it, but in his mind, it was free will. How he could reject original sin, it's like a, what I just said, is confounding to me that he was, wasn't able to see the fallacy of his own reasoning and abandon this thing altogether. How he could believe on one hand that a man is born innocent with the total independent will to choose between right and wrong, able to do that before God, and then at the same time say that the outcome of his salvation is predetermined by election, it blows your mind, doesn't it? But that's what this guy did. You have to be effectively called by this divine grace, chosen beforehand, before the foundation, like Ephesians chapter 1, Romans 8 says, you know, that's the best scriptures he used here. And there's no possibility of ever shipwrecking your faith or turning back or going reprobate or forfeiting your birthright or any of the things the Bible says. That Those are all uh, people never say to begin with. You know, and we'll look at some of those scriptures. Okay, Finney said, here's his first quote. I don't have a whole lot of quotes of them, but you can, you can look up the lectures yourself. Finney said, God has from eternity resolved the salvation of the elect. This can be seen. This we have seen. No one of this number will be lost. He's referring to that verse in John 6, 39. They are given to Christ from eternity as a seed to serve him. Their conversion, their perseverance, final salvation is secure. Their conversion, perseverance, and salvation is secure by the means of the grace of God in Christ prevailing through the gospel so to influence their free will as to bring about the results. That's how he did it, see? You got that? To influence their free will. To bring them in. They don't have no choice. They were predetermined. They were handpicked from the foundation of the world. But there's free will here. How he could not see the fallacy of what he just said there, I have no clue. I, I wouldn't match my intellect to this man for, for anything. The man's intellect was far superior to mine. But yet he couldn't see the fallacy of his teaching. Which proves to me that he would never abandon then his Presbyterian roots, which teach this nonsense. So he arrived at this conclusion by piecing together these scriptures, as I've shown, as I said in the beginning of John uh, 6 and Romans 10 and uh, Romans chapter 8, 1 Peter. Uh, there's many, many scriptures that seem to indicate everything's predetermined, everything's pre elected, and, and God chose it all beforehand and from the foundation of the world. But see, again, you're implying too much. Because, like you said, you go to Hebrews 3.14. Is it if you endure, if you take up your cross, if you endure to the end, all those kind of, you got, you got to weigh it against the other scriptures. But all this is the stronghold of modern eternal security teaching, as we've seen. So if it's true that, that none that are truly saved will ever be lost, as he said, well then, why would the scriptures then constantly warn the chosen and the elect in the scriptures of the possibilities of deception, of going reprobate. Remember what that word reprobate means in the scripture. It's used in Hebrews 6, verse 8. It's used as burned there, where it says whose end is to be burned. It's the same word reprobate. Same thing used in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, where Paul said, I buffet my body so that after I preach to others, I don't become reprobate. I don't become disqualified. I think it's disqualified or cast away in the modern versions. But the word was reprobate in the King James. That's what you'd look up if you want to look up in the, in the Greek lexicons. And it's used all through the scriptures in that manner, meaning completely lost, outcast, burned, as I have said in Hebrews 6.8, it's translated. And Finney knows that. Finney knows in Hebrews 6.8 that word was translated burned, whose end is to be burned. He was talking about the people that fall away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They had tasted the good word to come, the age of the come. You've read that in Hebrews chapter 6, one, verses 1 through 6. We'll go down to verse 8, and it gives you the illustration of what happens to those people. If they don't repent, the ground then becomes parched and useless, whose end is to be burned. Burned. 
That word's reprobating. So you see, to finish, you couldn't become reprobated. You can't forfeit the kingdom. So if you grant then that the language of election, of foreknowledge and predestination is used in the scriptures, that God knows the final outcome of every human soul that is born, how does that bind him then to that outcome that he decides for them? Now, I don't think it does. I think, I think that's way off base. See, within this divine plan, the scriptures show that God can change his mind according to the choices that men make in relationship to the degrees of God. He's not bound by any absolute outcome to any given situation or individual. Of course, he can alter time. He can stop the clock. He can do whatever he wants. But scripture shows in what manner he works. See, if a person like Paul or Peter or anybody in the, in the scriptures is predestined according to the foreknowledge of God, as we can go to 1 Peter 1-2, and, and, and it reads in that manner, then their final salvation is uh, still contingent on their obedience and endurance to the end. But to Finney, of course, that's a foregone conclusion. But yet, why would there be constant warnings? If it was a foregone conclusion, why would Peter and Paul both warn people of the possibility, I won't go on reprobate, Paul, as Paul warned, and falling into the error of the wicked, as Peter warned in 2 Peter 3.17. You don't fall from your steadfastness into the error of the wicked. You fall from your steadfast faith. Just like Romans 2.7 says, so that's how you get in. Continue, he who continues, continues in steadfast to the end. See, that the fact that, again, in John 5.24, it talks about you've passed from death unto life. Because you believed. In other words, Finney also, in this, believed in the eternal now doctrine of, of Augustine, the Augustinian doctrine of eternal now, meaning that God exists outside of eternity, and that once you exercise faith, once you have that moment of faith, then it's a done deal. You might as well be there. Isn't that exactly what's said today by people like Lucer and Ed Young? And they, they act like you're already in heaven. It's a done deal. See, you make your arrangement, as a lot of these guys like to say. And, it, and it's it's done deal. See, because you've believed once, then the arrangement is made. He says, you're there already. But given within the parameter, you know, the scriptures are given to us within the parameters of time in the present tense, which show, shows clearly in the Greek. Just like passages in Titus 3, 7, where it says, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's how you would translate that in, into modern English. You might become heirs according to why? Because it's in that tense that it's not, it's not completed yet. Jesus spoke in this manner throughout the Gospels, <coughs> saying in John 6, 24, he who is now believing. The Greek tense denotes, again, and Finney knew this, the Greek tense denotes continued and repeated action in order to attain the outcome. Continued and repeated action in order to retain the outcome. And all these Greek scholars, so-called Greek scholars, know that. It's not, it's, not, it's not hidden. You can find these things out very easily. God is not addressing man from the eternal now or outside of time. He's, he is, this teaching has led people like Finney and others into false hopes because they, they profess this nominal faith that they were elected and all, and they hope against hope that they're saved, but they really have no witness. They have no change in their life. Prophet Jeremiah really points this out, that God reacts in the parameters of time in, in Jeremiah 32, 35, where the people were, were offering their children in the sacrificial fires of Baal. And God proclaimed through Jeremiah, he says, I did not command them to do this, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination. Here God's saying it didn't even come, it didn't even cross his mind that the people would do such a thing. Now whether you want to argue or not that God foreknew what they were going to do, it really makes no difference to the fact what it says here, and it shows clearly that he acts in accordance with men's decisions and outcomes can vary. Just like in Nineveh when they preached to the people. Maybe God will relent. Remember that the king said? They repented. He didn't know it was a done deal. He couldn't see the future. But he knew that God would turn from his fierce wrath if the people, people fell in and repented before him. 
In Exodus chapter, there's all kinds of these, but I just picked a couple. In Exodus 32, verses 31 through 35, Moses in the wilderness. You've seen this in all the movies about Moses, when they had fashioned the golden image. It's called a golden god in Scripture, not necessarily a calf. Uh, Moses pleaded with God to spare them when he went back to the mountain and prayed. He says, pray that blot my name out instead. So God changed his mind. He was going to destroy the whole nation. But he changed his mind. He curved his fierce wrath, punished only the evildoers. So again, because why? Because of what Moses intervened, his faith. There's several more instances of this throughout the Old Testament, dealing with man within the parameters of time, showing that he is not bound to any particular outcome, but acts on the contingency of man's choice in many cases. Of course, he can override man's choice if he wants to. Of course, he can do those things. Bring forth the Messiah. Bring forth the nation of Israel. When he returns to the earth. All those kind of things. Are, those things are predetermined. Those things can't be altered. So Finney said, again, next quote by Finney. This grace I regard as vouchsafed to me, in other words, safe, it's an old word, to me, is the covenant of grace as the reward of Christ's obedience and death. It is pledged to secure the salvation of those whom the Father from eternity has given to the Son. Back to that John 6.39 verse. He refers to that everywhere. The Holy Spirit is given to them to secure their salvation, and I have no exception that any others will ever be saved. In other words, nobody else but the elect will be saved. It's impossible. He makes that perfectly clear in those lectures. But these, every one of them, will be surely saved. There is and there can be no hope for any others. Others are able to repent, but they will not. Again, that's his free will thing. See, they can repent. They, they could decide to try to follow God, but God didn't choose them. Many are called, few are chosen, remember. Scripture said that. That's the scripture he would use there. Others might be saved if they would believe and comply with the conditions of salvation, but they can't. Man, what, 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 a, what a tyrannical, monstrous God that depicts before mankind. No wonder there have been wars and inquisitions and, and crusades and all the other things throughout history. With that, that view and concept of a God that rules over his creation, and he's going to throw babies into hell if he wants to, and most of the uh, created uh, people that he died for, he made propitiation for the sins of the whole world, John said he did. But no, not these guys, only the elect. Because he couldn't have died for somebody that's never going to be saved. That wouldn't have been right. That would, have, that would insult his sovereignty. I don't have anything to do with God's sovereignty. So my, by necessity then, Finney's got to teach these two things. That the truly elect can never be lost, which we pointed out. Number two, that no New Testament passage anywhere in the Bible in the New Testament, teaches that a true saint can fall into eternal ruin. Now here's where it gets sticky. Here's where he's willing to do anything with the Scriptures to prove his point. So the doctrine then becomes the perfect cop-out, as I would call it. If you, if you endure in obedience and holiness to the end, you were among the elect, and your salvation was secure from the foundation of the world. We just read that. If you go reprobate or shipwreck or fall away or turn aside or anything, any of the other things the scripture warns about, swerve into the error of the wicked, be deceived by the strong delusion, then you weren't elect to begin with. You were never saved. And no matter how much you want to include free choice here, there is no free choice. Because you end up back to square one with John Calvin. That only the elect, he chooses, he makes the decision, God decides who's saved and who isn't. Now with Finney... Your election meant that you were you would indeed persevere in holiness if you were truly elected. See, that would that be the evidence of that would be that you obey God, live above sin, endure to the end in holiness. Your choice to do so then, as as I read, was worked into the structure of your election, of your salvation. The call, the uh, the grace to give you the obedience to do so. It had nothing to do with anything you did. But he'll say, well, your free will chose that. God allowed your free will. It doesn't make sense. It's all predetermined. You respond to the, to the degree that God's effectual calling is exerted over your will to bring about that obedience and endurance and faith that is necessary to work out your salvation. 
So, let's move into some more double speak here. And that's what. That's exactly what this is. Finney said, it's a longer quote, he said, the saints convert themselves in the sense that they turn or yield when drawn. Again, he has to have free will there. Until over-persuaded by the Holy Spirit, God converts them in the sense that he effectively draws and persuades them. Well, God still, God does it for them. Okay. They turn themselves in the sense that they're turning in their own act. God turns them in the sense that he induces or produces their turning. So who did it? You or God? The same is true of the whole course of, of their obedience of life. The saints keep themselves in the sense that all their obedience is their own, and their piety consists of their own voluntary obedience. It sounds good, see? It sounds good, your voluntary obedience. But God keeps them in the sense that in every incidence, in every moment of obedience, he persuades and enlightens and draws them so much as secure their voluntary obedience. That is, he draws and they follow. In other words, he does it for them. Just like, exactly like Piper teaches. Exactly the same thing. That you, it's essential that you persevere. It's essential that you have works. That you have holiness. But the thing is, you trust that it's already done. It, it's already predetermined. That's exactly the same teaching. It, it's, there's no different. He persuades and they yield to his persuasions. He works in them to will and to do, and they will do. God always anticipates all their holy exercises and persuades them to put them forth. To, to do them. This is so abundantly taught in the Bible as to quote scripture to prove it would be a waste of time. Of course, in that, I'd say you can prove anything in the scriptures. The saints are only said to be converted, but also sanctified and kept. Now the scripture says, he says, he says they keep themselves, but then he keeps them. Now the scripture says, keep yourself pure. Keep yourself in the love of God, it says in Jude. Keep yourself from idols, John tells him in 1 John 5. It doesn't sound like he says, well, God's going to keep you from idols. It says, keep yourself those things. Keep yourself pure. It tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. Keep your... That's the only thing that makes sense, that it's of your free volition, your will, to do so. Not that God has to bend your will, compel you, overcome you, predetermine that you're going to do it. That does not make sense. So in other words... You don't have to obey from your heart, like Romans 6.17 says. He would say the same thing Piper says there, that he obeyed for you. That's what you're thanking God for in that verse, that he, he obeyed for you. Even though it says you obeyed from your heart, that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, having been set free from sin, became a slave of righteousness. No, he did it for you. You expect that God will persuade you in some manner then to, to follow him, obey him rather than the obedience itself being the principle of the faith. See, that's the problem with this. See, the principle behind faith is obedience. It's action. Surely he's saying that the result is action, but since God is doing it, he's ordained it, he's elected and predestinated, predetermined the whole thing, it's not essential. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't matter to the outcome of your salvation. Argue this until you're blue in the face and run out of breath with me. It boils down to the same thing. If God brings about the outcome and his election cannot be altered as we've already shown you, then man's choice is irrelevant. It doesn't count. God made the choice. What man does or does not do makes no difference with the outcome of reaching the conclusion. So we go right back to John MacArthur and Piper and what them guys teach. That's the reason they teach what they teach. That teaching has culminated into this mess we got today. That it doesn't, doesn't John MacArthur even say, it doesn't matter what you do or don't do or add or speak away or commend yourself. Or, it doesn't make any difference. It's all been done. You're in or you're not in. See, this is why Finney would have to go to great lengths to explain away the scriptures and to prove that no true saint ever could or ever will fall into eternal ruin. Here he shows his true colors as a closet Calvinist.